Fifth and sixth graders will be in here for this service and next service. Feel free to grab a seat and welcome to Renovation Church. It's a little bit different setup than normal. It's a little bit strange because we walked in this morning and... He was supposed to wear khakis. I, but... I didn't realize I was supposed to wear khakis, but... You live in the same house, though. I don't know what's happening here. All right, so uh, question and response. We got some questions. Yes, we do. I think we have some responses. We got to, we're going to do it the professional way. Who goes first? Okay. You call them the tin or you call them the palm tree? Well, I'm calling the palm tree. All right. What was it? It's palm tree. I can't see it. Oh, I'm first. All right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's Israeli money, too. So, I mean, it's got to be official. All right. So... There is no point in waiting any longer. Might as well get rolling. I got too much stuff here. All right, so the first question, and if you guys wonder what happens, um, we get these questions, and usually Dustin sits there and reads two of them, and we both like, oh, I don't know, and he goes, and he just won't even show them to you, like, pick one. So that's, it's real official. Very no. professional. Like, honestly, <laughs> sometimes the questions are, you know, maybe more tailored to one or the other, but most of the time we just kind of split them up. And uh, we always want them ahead of time because, like, if, if we tried to do this live, you would get our opinion. And you don't want our opinion. That's worthless. Right. So we do it this way. And this first one was awesome um, because I got the question. Dustin was there. I think we both had to Google what it, the question was. So the question is, <laughs> is monostasism wrong? If not, why don't more people do it? All right, first question. What's well, monostasism, right? That's where we were, yeah? So, we'll Google it. Monostasism is basically means dwelling alone. So, you want to know my answer? Yes, it's wrong. And, I mean, here's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. First of all, in Hebrews 10.25, says, Not forsaking our own assembling together as a habit of some, but encourage one another, and in all more as you see the day drawing near. Now, We've talked about this last week a little bit. If you back up to 19, he's talking to his brother, and he is talking to the Jews here. But we are called to encourage, because even though he's talking to the Jews here, we still use this stuff to learn by, and God shows us this stuff so we know what we're supposed to do. And how are we going to encourage one another if we're doing alone? Right? How are we going to do it? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. So let's just say, okay, I got somebody that totally believes, well, that wasn't written for me, that was written for the Jews. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.11 because Paul is very clear. Sorry, guys. Paul's very clear here in 1 Thessalonians because he's talking to everybody here. We've, I've preached out of Thessalonians. Paul's talking to both Jew and Gentile in the church of Thessalonica. Now, Tara says, too quiet. We'll get there in a minute. All right, is that better? So Paul is talking to both Jew and Gentile. He's talking to a, just a mosh pit of people like we got sitting right here. And what he says here is, therefore, encourage one another, build up one another, just as you also are doing. They were already doing it. I think we do a good job doing it. But if you're going to live this monostasism life where you're dwelling alone, how are you going to encourage? Most of all, how are you going to do what we're supposed to do? And how are you going to go and tell the good news of Jesus? Like the only reason we're here is to tell other people what Jesus has done for me so they can go and turn their whole life around and be a path on their way to heaven. Well, if I'm living all alone, dwelling alone, how, how are we doing the Great Commission? So for me, we are called to be in the world, but we're not called to be of the world. Amen. And so we're called to be in the world. So monostasin to me is not for us. No, I will not. Let's see, M O N A S. T I C I S M. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm done. That's all I had on it. So I, I, I'm going to jump in. We're going to we'll do this to each other's questions. So monostasism, it, it, the argument for that is, well, if you're focusing on yourself and, and you're not harming the world, which you have monks, you have nuns, mm -hmm. that's kind of what monostasism is. Yep. And which is true, you, you might not be harming the world, but you're also not. You're harm, you are harming the world by not sharing the truth. Yeah, I love it. Not Great sharing answer. the gospel. Great answer. All right. So my uh, first question is a very renovation question. 
As Christians, where should we stand with tattoos? <laughs> yes or no? And what does God think about Bible-oriented tattoos? So here we go. Tom just went, yeah! I think this was a Tom question. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Everything was spelled right. It's not Tom's. <laughs> So I just want to jump into Leviticus real quick. This is the argument against tattoos. Um, Leviticus 19, 28, because we love laws. It says, do not cut your bodies for dead or put, tattoo, or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. So the Bible doesn't really tell us why the law was given to the Jews. But history, like we go, and I, you have to dig into history to understand the Bible. You get that. You have to know what's going on in the time for sure. So in history, if we were to dig into that and look at it, Jews... Didn't say a whole lot about it, but in the pagan world, in the, in the very Gentile dark world, it was, uh, if you, it, it was, it was not uncommon for them to have tattoos of their many gods that they worshiped, like all the, all the little G gods, all the fake gods. They would tattoo those all over their body because they figured that was their way of worshiping. And they would, some even worship each other because they had a tattoo. So you'd go like, all right, I'm going to put, my brother's got a tattoo of, of the, of the God of fertility. So all of the women that want to get pregnant, they go look at his arm and they, and they worship his arm. I mean, it was weird. And it was, it was, I get where they had to say something like, Hey, you got to stop doing this Mm -hmm. because we can't be like all these other people. Now the new, the new Testament, however, does not give specific clarity on whether getting a tattoo is a sin but it does give us some clarity on, on the body being the temple, right? Yeah. In 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, it says this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So here, here's what we have to look at. A lot of it is what you're doing and the purpose of what you're doing. Why are you doing it? What, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it just so you can show off how great a piece of artwork is? Or, or, or is there something to it? I mean, because that, that, that matters. I mean, really it does. I mean, yeah, it does. And, and, and also, whatever we do has to glorify God. So in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says this, whether, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. So here's my challenge for you. and Because cause Scripture tells us in the old law that we shouldn't do that because obviously if you look at history they were, they were using it as a worship tool and God doesn't want that so here's what I'll tell you if you're getting a tattoo before you do it I would ask this are you glorifying God by it? are you glorifying God by putting that on your arm? listen I don't have any I, this is a perfectly beautiful landscape with nothing on it <laughs> but I'm married to a woman that has tattoos her landscape is much better than mine I'd probably edit that out maybe later. So I'll leave you with that. There's got to be whatever you do, you have to be fully convinced that it's God's will in your life. And that goes with everything. Mm-hmm. So if you're getting a tattoo, you've got to be convinced that it's glorifying God. Mm-hmm. Because here's the deal. It's not what other people think. It's about your relationship with Christ and all that you do. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, God's not going to call everybody that there against you and everybody that was for you to talk, to talk for you. God's good. You're going to stand before him, we're going and to you're, going to be, you're going to be the one answering for your actions. Yeah. We're going to talk about this here in a little bit, if we get there. If we get there. Yeah, I've got a question on that. So. Awesome. Yeah. We throw up Romans real quick, 10, or 14, 21 through 23. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything that which makes your brother stumble. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts and condem- is condemned if he eats, because he is eat- his eating is not a- from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. So when you're looking at tattoos, when you're looking at what you're eating, when you're looking at what you're wearing, when you're looking at how you're living your life, the job that you have, the friends that you hang out with, every bit of it, you need to be sure that you're not making a brother stumble. Yeah. Which is why you'll always hear me talk against alcohol, always. Mm-hmm. That's why you'll always hear me talk against drugs. I don't care how legal things get. Because you may be perfectly fine with it, but if it makes a brother stumble, then that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'll leave you with that. I also think uh, in some cases that we get to see here, it does show where you've been. Absolutely. And where you've came from, but now where you're going. So 
Um, but yeah, and I agree. It's no different than the way we dress. We, me and Tara was in Springfield and seen some people dressed. No, we wasn't. We was in St. Charles, downtown St. Charles. And I literally had a girl walk by in almost nothing. And I said, that just makes me sad for this country. Yeah. I was in Nicaragua where they dress appropriately everywhere they go. Pants, button-up shirt. Like, even the youth don't wear shorts down there. And it's hot. And I come here and I see people half-dressed on the streets. And I just said, it's the same thing as what we're talking about here. Yeah. Does it glorify, is that glorifying God? Absolutely not. So, yeah, awesome. I'm glad you drew that one. I remember we had those. He had them like this. He told me what they were. I'm like, oh, boy. I don't know which one I want. <laughs> All right. The question I got here is uh, it's talking about Scripture in Luke 1, 78 through 79, our awesome Scriptures. This is what the, it said. Uh, this applies to us, doesn't it? Question mark. And then in parentheses, it says, I'm praying this over my girls and myself regardless, but I was just curious. So I, I love questions like this. Um, we just talked about that Scripture in Hebrews was written for the Jews, and I appreciate this person asking this. And the response is, this is uh, Zechariah's prophecy. It's talking about John the Baptist, uh, the father of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and he's celebrating God's fulfillment of prophecy. That's what this little part of the scripture is about, is he is celebrating that God did what God said he's going to do. And it starts talking about that the Old Testament Malachi had a lot of details about the person that was going to come that was going to announce Jesus. Okay, and that's what we're reading here. Uh, Malachi 3.1 says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come in his temple, and the messenger of his covenant, and whom you delight, behold, is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So this is Malachi basically explaining John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And this is Zacharias saying, Look what God did. He came through on this promise way back then that Malachi talks about in my son. He's going to declare the way of the Lord. So we get to 78 and 79 and listen to what it says. It doesn't matter if this is for you or not. This is awesome scripture. Because of the tender mercy of God with which the sunrise from the high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadows of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. So verse 78 there, the sunrise on high. You guys see something about that sunrise? It's not a little S, right? That's, that's a big S for a reason. That's the sun. That's Jesus. Jesus is the sunrise from upon high. And that's what this is talking about. So, yes, this is absolutely for us as Christians. The, the sunrise upon high will visit us. At some point in your life, if you're a born-again Christian in this room, the sun has shown up in your life. Amen. If you're not yet, he's waiting to show up in your life. And today's your day. But the sun will show up in your life. And that's what this is talking about. He showed up with each one of us at one point. And then you go on to 79. It says that we were dead in our transgressions of sin, basically. To shine upon those who sat in the darkness of the shadows. We were dead in our trespasses of sin. We had no hope until that sunrise happened in our lives. So this scripture is absolutely for us. And I want to go even farther. It shows that Jesus is the only light for this whole world. He's the only hope for this whole world. That's why these scriptures are in here. But keep praying over your girls. Whoever this is, keep praying over your girls. Keep praying over yourself. And how important is it to, like we've talked about, if you're going to be praying over somebody, you're praying the Ruach, the breath of God, the word of God over your family. That's what we're called to do. Praying scripture over your family is so powerful. So powerful. Because like I said, it goes with the same thing with me and Dustin coming up here and answering these out of our opinions. It doesn't matter. But when we can answer it with Scripture, when we can answer it with what God says is right, when you're praying this over your children, you're praying the Word of God over them, that is the best thing you can do. So whoever this is, this absolutely, to me, these verses are for us as Christians because it talks about the Son and our only hope is in Jesus. And please keep praying over your family. Keep praying Scripture over your family. So powerful. Amen. I would, I would challenge you on this because I know, I know I, we do it in our house, and I know Hayden and Tara do it in theirs. We don't just pray for the now. I'm praying for my 16-year-old daughter's future husband. I'm mm -hmm. praying for their life down the road because I know that God's already got plans in that, and I, wanna, I just want to call his grace in on that. I, I just want to know that I'm part of making sure that I'm in, inviting God into it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, keep praying scripture over your family. Yes. And if you're not, I highly recommend it.
For those of you that are afraid to pray, what easier to do than just get word out and just start yeah. saying it out loud? You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about thinking about how etiquette, how to pray, because I know some, that's how we worry in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But we just get it out and start, start reading it as a prayer. Nothing wrong with that. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. My second question is, if God created the world, then who created God? Man. How did you get all I'm, those? I'm not I sure. These? I don't know. So let me tell you this. I don't know. Because it ain't, it ain't possible. No. We can, we can try to grab stuff that, aren't, that isn't there, but it's not there to grab. So, so here's what I'm going to read to you. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Mm-hmm. So before I read any further, I just want you to rest on that. You can't rest on what you don't know. So all we can know is the fact that he says, I was first, I'm last, there's nothing else besides me. Yeah. So no one created God because God is the creator. God's always been, God always will be. And we have a choice, though. Here's the awesome part. We can choose to be with him or not be with him. So uh, that's the choice we get to make. And then you go on in verse 7, it says, who is like me? I love this because who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. We don't have a shy, afraid God. Mm-mm. No. From, from the time that established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. He's saying, listen, if you, if you think you're God, come to the carpet and let's talk about it. I want you to tell everybody how it all happened. Because he's saying, I, I was here. I, I created the first nation. I'm going to be here after the last one stands and falls because I'm going to create the new one. He, he's, he's not afraid to sell, say that. Do, do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me, or is there any rock? I know of none. So, listen. There, you can you can scour history. You can scour other books and other people's thoughts. But the, but it's very simple. God was the beginning, and God is the end. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega. He is everything. No one created him because he is the Creator, and he's always been. And if you try to think beyond that, trust me, you're just going to spin your wheels. Because there are only, you know, you're just going to get lost and the enemy's going to have a hold. When you try to outdo God, you're, you're going you're gonna to fail. Because at that point in time, you're, you're, creating your, you're, you're putting yourself in the role of God. That's a dangerous place to be. Go ahead. You done? Yeah, I don't know what to that say. Was that was it? Man. What say? So, uh, <laughs> let me get it here. He, he caught me off guard. I was switching over to the scripture. I'm not playing on the iPad. I actually have scripture on here. Just so you guys know. Um, what I like is he's talking about this and it goes way back. And, you know, God says, I am. That's it. Mm-hmm. I am. And we go all the way. I, Terry doesn't have this. So Revelation um, 1.8 says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So it just over and over, God is who he says he is, and he says, I am the I am. And so there is isn't, comes into play. There, that is where your faith comes into play, um, for sure. But no, I don't have anything. That's awesome. Awesome. All right. It's question number three for me. Uh, do you have to be of a certain religion to go to heaven? See, I, I didn't give you all the hard ones. Um, no. But, right? No, dot, 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 but. Matthew 17, or Matthew 7, 14 says, For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who will find it. The gate is small. This is Jesus talking. The narrow is the way and few will find it. Um, John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, this is Jesus again, I am the way. And the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So I'll be honest with you, religion doesn't matter. Religion doesn't matter. Like you can be the most religious person coming to church every time the doors are open, and you can be straight on your way to hell. The Bible's very clear. Jesus says it right here I am the way. Jesus is what matters. We've already talked about we're supposed to gather together to encourage one another and church is important 
religion, church, whatever you want to call it, it is important. We're supposed to be together. We're supposed to help carry each other's burdens. We're supposed to help each other through hard times. But to actually, to be on your way to heaven, no. Church can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. I can't save you. What Dustin says up here can't save you. I get so scared all the time. I know Dustin does too. As a pastor, you get scared that people find their religion or, or they find their Jesus through what I said. And if you're only finding it through what I said and not through what God said and not through that Holy Spirit changing in your heart, I want you to look back at it. Make sure. Like there's too many man-made salvations in this world. There's too many religions that will say, pray this prayer and you're good. I, I, I dare say that pray this prayer and you're going to heaven, maybe sending more people to hell than anything else. Uh, I told Dustin some of my responses aren't real nice. I'm sorry, but the church can't save you. Look at Acts 4, 12. And there is a salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men to which we must be saved. A name over the building doesn't matter. The name over the religion does not matter. What matters is the name above all names. In the old, they call him Yeshua, Jesus, my salvation. That's the name that matters. Renovation doesn't matter to any of us, except this is where we come to encourage one another, to love on one another, to learn how to tell other people about Jesus. I mean, John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It doesn't say God so loved the world that I sent this religion so you could find your way, does it? Has anybody went through the Bible and found a scripture that said, God sent this religion so you can find eternal life? It's not in my Bible. If you have a Bible that says that, there's a trash can on the way out. Because like, it doesn't say that in any of ours, I promise. Um, the only way to heaven is Jesus. It says it over and over and over. He is the only way. It has nothing to do with religion, but everything to do with the relationship with him. Everything. The Sadducees and the Pharisees had the strongest religion there was. These guys knew the word. They knew the Old Testament. They were trying to constantly catch Jesus. They were so religious that when the Son of God was staying in front of them, they missed it. They were so stuck in their religion that they were looking for these signs. And the Son of God, Jesus himself was standing in front of them, and they missed it. So don't get wrapped up in a religion. Get wrapped up in a relationship with a church full of people that have relationships that want to live together and do life together. And that's what we have here, and I love it. You know, the Sadducees and Pharisees, for example, they, they started because they were trying to do the right thing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. They wanted to keep to the law, but they got mm -hmm. so caught up in the law that they started making new laws to stay inside the law. They were so caught up in the law that they missed him standing right in front yes. of them. Yep. I uh, wanted to note on that. I think it's kind of interesting because you talk about religions. And that you can all you can break that down to denominations if you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, because even if you... If I tried to steer away from that, but whatever. Do whatever you want. I mean... <laughs> There's normally a line, and I'm always <laughs> jumping on the other side of it. But, you know, it, the reality and the truth is, if you ask most people inside their denomination why they're in their denomination, they don't know the difference. Because their mom and dad were. They don't know the difference between an assembly of God, a uh, general Baptist, a free will Baptist, uh, a southern Baptist, uh, a Methodist. They don't, know, they don't know the difference between a Nazarene. They don't see the differences in that. You know why? Because they, they, they are surface level on on what the beliefs of the following Jesus is. And that's okay. Because the things that we dive into that draw the division between the denominations typically don't matter. No. no. We get caught up in interpretations. And, and, and I love, you know, you said Ye Yeshua. And I, and I just had a question this morning. And Clint asked me um, how we got to the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I couldn't remember all the interpretations. but So I went back there and I, and I checked it real quick. And because it, was, it went through... Hebrew to Greek to Latin to, to English. And by the time we got to English, it was Jesus. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make Jesus any wrong, any less right to say than Yeshua, but it's just a different place, yeah. a different language. And like I said, if you feel comfortable calling him that in prayer, call him that. It Absolutely. Does, I mean, it says in the Bible, he hears our moans and our groans, not even the words. So, yeah, he's going to answer, I believe. Yes. Yep. No, yeah. I tried to stay away from denominations, but good job. Do what it can. Well, here's my next question. <laughs> How does love bind everything together in perfect unity? And they, they give Colossians 3.14, 
as an example. So it says, it says, paint a visual example. I'm not the artist. Hayden probably should oh, have, we should have brought the whiteboard. He, he typically, when we do meetings, he is doodling and drawing stuff on his iPad. But he's actually reading today. It says in, in 3.14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, which is awesome to read that. But if you read that by itself, you're like, what does that even mean? I can't paint a picture with that because you have to go a little deeper than that. So, so I'm going to read a little deeper in that saying. I'm just going to go to the next verse. And she might be able to throw it up there. I just didn't give it to her. And in verse 15 it says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. I love that we're talking again about one body. Yeah. And be thankful. But here's where the picture is painted, right here in verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's the picture that's painted of how do we walk in that unity of peace. Well, we have to start worshiping together. We have to start praising God together. We can't look at other people and be like, man, if I raise my hands in worship or if I sing too loud, they're going to they're gonna say something. They're going to think something. You know, if I'm reading my Bible and I've got this translation and they don't like it, they're going to think I'm weird and I don't have the... You know what? I'm just glad you're reading the Bible to begin with. But I get it. I, I understand. And I'll be honest with you, some translations are better than others. But I'm not going to beat you up over it. And I'm not going to beat you over how you worship. I'm not going to beat you up how you dress when you come into church. Because here's what I want you to do. I want you to come in, love God, and let God change you. Yeah. Yeah. Let God change you because I don't have all the answers of how you're supposed to walk your life out because I don't know what your call is. I don't know the path that God has for you. And so when I draw, when I think about painting this picture, I literally just go to that and say, okay, what does it look like? It looks like I should have wisdom from God for myself so I do the right things that I know that I'm supposed to do. And then I, and then I come together with the other people and we worship God together and it's going to look different. Hayden and I don't worship the same. We don't. A lot of times we don't even think the same. We disagree on stuff. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't love him any less, and he doesn't love me any less, and we don't argue about it. I don't ever say, well, you're just stupid. I do. Well, he does, but I don't. <laughs> Some of us are farther along our walk than others. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. No, you know, we, we meet each other where we're at, and, and we give God's grace. And I know that he's studying the Word, so why would I want to correct him on something I know God will deliver him to? Because I know God's going to deliver me to something, so I don't want him to correct me. I want to hear his opinion. That's one of the things I love about when we did Genesis together. They still do Genesis together. But, you know, when, when Hayden and I and Craig were up here, all three of us very, very often were on different places and different planes in yeah. our thought process. But that didn't mean that we, we didn't love each other. We didn't love the same Jesus. That didn't mean we didn't worship the same God. It just meant that we were in different spots where God had us in our wisdom and in our growth. Mm -hmm. And we'll never all three or all of us be in the same place. Listen, there's 500 people that come here on Sunday mornings or whatever. And no two are in the same exact place. And so we need to understand that, love them where they're at, and keep focusing on our growth and bringing them along with us. And when someone tries to give us wisdom that God's given them, take it and pray about it. And then do your own homework. I'm putting away the... Oh, we need one of those uh, little, uh, the chess things. Oh, we do. Next time. What did somebody say? Somebody know the name of it? Anyways. No, I, somebody is smart you know, enough. They know the name of yeah. it. We'd have to Google it. Um, we go back, you know, it's talking about love there. And uh, when we started this church, there was a big push on no matter what, they can come in. And I think that's 100% right. And because that's true love. When you meet somebody where they're at, that's truly showing love. Um, you know, it goes back to, like, when I, I literally got woke up with a dream, and I think Dustin then walked in, I was in the church on the sound booth, and I painted the R with love them to salvation. That's how it all started. I don't know if God sent that dream or not. I have no idea, but it was in my head. And that's the way we got to be. We got to love people where they're at because we can't expect a lost person to walk in here and act the way somebody's been saved for 20 years acts. If we do, we're doing it wrong. Amen. Like, we can't expect somebody to come in here and know the Apostles' Creed when half of us in here can't, you know, rattle it off like Craig does. 
but everybody's at a different spot. Some not even have a walk yet. And the first part is just showing them how much we love them, how much Jesus loves them, so they can start that walk. Amen. And they can start that move. And things start to change because Jesus is doing the changing, not because of something we said. So, yeah, absolutely. Love it. Love it. All right. Question four. How do I let my pride down? That was a question. Uh, My response is, how can you not? How can you not? Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before a fall. We got, we've heard that our whole lives. We read it. We read it here. But what happens if we don't let it down? You're going to fall because of it. And listen, don't, if this is yours, I'm not, I'm not looking down at you. I'm not preaching down at you because I have my own problems, okay? I'm just saying, how can we not let it down? James 4, 6. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud, against the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. I need more grace. I need all of it I can get. Uh, But what really caught me, we're talking about how can I, how do I let my pride down? If God's absolutely against it, how can I still be trying to hold on to it in my life? Why am I still holding on to it in my life? Does it make you more of a man or a woman because you're holding on to that pride? No, it's not. It's setting you up for destruction. It's scripture. It's setting you up that God opposes that. John, or 1 John 2, 16, that first makes a difference when you're reading scripture, right, Dustin? Like 1 John and John doesn't have the same words in it. It makes a difference. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. You're still struggling with pride in your life. John says it's because it's coming from the world. That's what the scripture says. It's coming from the world that we're still prideful in our walk and in our lives. It's, we're letting that world slip in. The world's saying, oh, you gotta be a manly man. You gotta be this kind of woman. You gotta be prideful. And God is saying, I'm opposed to that. You got to let that go. And it's all because we're still trying to let, we're trying to hold on a little bit of that world. We have to die to ourselves every day. We read that, we say that, but me included, we don't do that. Dying to ourselves is not what I think we think in our minds. We think, oh, well, I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to get up and go to church on Sunday. That's not what he's talking about. I mean, how many people struggled to get here this morning? You have to raise your hand. How many people struggled to get here? Like, oh, I didn't want to go today. Uh, guys, I get to go to church. That's not dying to ourselves. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Two masters. Pride can become a master. It makes it very clear that God is not a, not a fan of pride. The good news is he can take pride away from your life like he can take anything else. He can take it just like that if you'll let him. You have to be willing to let it go. And this probably, to me, is the most used but not done scripture in the Bible is Matthew 16, 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, if you wish to come after me, you must deny himself and take up your cross and follow me. We think about that. I've seen a shirt that said, I'll carry the cross. And I love it. But do we mean it? Do you know what that means? He went to the cross and he died for you. Are you willing to die to yourself? Are you willing to die to the pride, to the lust, to the world? I, I'm not always. Listen, we all have struggles in this room. We are no different. But he's saying over and over that God does not like pride. And if you're going to literally take up your cross every day when you get up, you're going to die to yourself and you're going to say, God, whatever it takes today, I am following you. Whatever you ask me to do this day, I will do it. And that's dying to self and carrying your cross every day. You have to be willing to give up everything, including pride for him. And that's hard. It's hard. What do you got? I seen you turn in there. Psalm ten four says uh, the wickedness and the haughtiness of his countenance 
which is pride, mm -hmm. does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to share that one because literally pride is why there is Satan. Mm -hmm. Pride is literally why there is, there is hell. If pride would have never come into play, if, 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 if Satan could have laid that down before he ever let that become who he was, then we wouldn't have to worry about anything. We would, we would all still be in a garden mm -hmm. of perfection without, without flaw. But pride is what, what caused the fall. And pride is what continues. It. And that, there's nothing new in any of this. No. I think that's what's crazy. The same story you know, we, over we, and Hayden over. And I talk about it all the time. You know, the Bible is all about the story of Jesus over and over again. And, but, but, the, but the opposite side of that is the Bible is, the opposite side of that is it's all about pride, which is Satan. Because mm -hmm. pride is, the, is what takes us away. And, and, and if we, we have to evaluate our life often. And you need to have people in your life that will help you evaluate it. I've got people that will call me out because I need that in my life. I used to be a very prideful person. And you know what, ha what happens when we get prideful? If something happens that we don't like, we get angry, right? Yep. And I've, I've been in meetings with, with my wife and, and Tara, and, and they look at my face because I wear it on my face well. So they'll say something that I'm like, mm, I don't know if I agree, and, and they'll give me grief about it because they're like, ah, oh, you're obviously, that's not, you, you know, we're disagreeing. And it, you know, I have to be careful of my old me, I, but I'm glad I got people that are like, listen, Dustin, you're, you're, you need to check that. Because we can easily go back to that because you get prideful, you get angry because it doesn't go your way, you get, you get an ego, and all of a sudden you're pushing this away as if there is no God because you are God. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Yep. Oh, I guess it's my turn. It's your turn. Wait. Strange man. When you are praying at the altar and get distracted by, the, by other things, how can you get your mind to stay on topic? Anybody else have that problem? Wandering minds, anybody? Terry, you better hold both hands. Man, more than I thought. You guys can't stay focused? Like, huh. I have, I have literally a one-track mind. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, you guys remember that little monkey with the little things? Ching, 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 ching. That was... It's happening right now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. Oh, goodness. That was perfect. <laughs> that might be a short for later on. Maybe. All right. So we throw up uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Thank you. So it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations, even lofty things raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience. Whenever, disobe whenever, obedience is com whenever, our, whenever your obedience is complete. So, so it's all about obedience and disobedience. So here's what I want you to think. So whenever you're at an altar, and you're trying to pray, and listen, we have busy altars. And there's a lot of stuff going on. They are tear-soaked, tear-stained altars. They are, they are busy altars, and I love that. So here's what we have to do. We have to meet God in our ability, and God takes the rest of the way. So what you know, Pastor Hayden shared earlier, and it's actually what I was going to talk about, we, have to, we can't battle this distraction the same way because it's a failure so far, right? So if you get distracted easily, you've got you to gotta stop struggling in the flesh and start seeking out his divine power, his supernatural power, how do we do that? Well, it's not going to be by just sitting here trying to pray even more, trying to figure that out. So here's my challenge to you. If you are one of these people that do that and you find yourself kind of uh, lost, for lack of better words, because you, you can't bring it back in, I'm going to challenge you to bring your Bible down to the altar with you. I'm going to challenge you this. I challenge you to get some scripture that you can flip to right away. Mark it, bend the tab in your Bible, do something. A place in your Bible that you know when you read it, that you just think about God, and that's about it. Nothing else creeps in because you're reading the Word. And so when you're praying, and you're praying, and you start to get wandering mind, you start to get off course because somebody's crying, or something's going on, or somebody's talking, and you're like, I can't focus, I want you to break out your Bible right here at the altar and just start reading it. And when your mind comes back, because it will, go back to praying. We have to change the process in how we do these things. We have to change our mindset. Because here's the deal. What we do is we get up and walk away because I just couldn't do it. 
I got, I got sidetracked. I couldn't focus. I couldn't pray. For me, I, I'll tell you what I do. I, I'm, I, don't, I haven't started bringing my Bible down, but I'm going to start that now. But I'm going to, normally what I'll do is I'll just sit there and I'll start saying Jesus. And when I say it enough, eventually my mind just kind of comes back. And I can focus. And, and, that, and that's how I can keep myself where I need to be. But we can't, but, you know, bringing down the word and you, and you start just reading the word and pretty much you're praying the word, as Pastor Hayden said in that very first or second question, you're bringing his word to the altar anyway. So the, the, the distraction that Satan's trying to get in your mind, or just maybe you just are distracted. Maybe it's not even Satan. You're just distracted. We give him too much credit sometimes. Yeah. Instantly. Maybe, maybe you're just distracted, and that's okay. So get the word out. Read for a little bit. And your altar time may be a little bit more, but you know what? That's okay, too. No one's going to say, well, they sure stayed up there for a long time. And if they did, shame on them. Because that's their pride getting in the way. So change the philosophy. Change the mindset. Bring your Bible to the altar. And if you struggle, break out the word and just start reading it. Click. Your turn. All right. Take it in the altar with this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we all probably should have took that into altar time, but that's all right. I got one more. Um, Tara, this is number nine, so it's down the list a little ways. And it goes right along with what we just talked about with pride. I should have probably stuck these together. It says, do I have to give up everything to be saved? Hmm. Um, listen, if we don't, like, we're in a room, we're doing Q&R. He's talking about what we should do at the altar, and we've talked about Christ. And if we don't leave you with the cross, we've not done what we're supposed to do. So this right here says, this question, number nine, says, do I have to give up everything to be saved? We've heard this from a different perspective. Look at Luke 9, 23 and 24. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake... He is the one that will save it. We've got to take that cross up. We've got to die to ourselves, And that starts with, uh, with saying yes to Jesus. That's what it starts to. And, you know, it says you have to give up everything. You give up everything to follow Christ, but you get everything. Like what he's got to offer. This, like, guys, listen, this world is so temporary. And as I get older, I look younger this week because I had a long story. But somebody lied to me about shaving for an officiating job. But anyways, long story. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but anyways, like, this stuff on this world is so temporary, but what he's got to offer is eternal. And what he's got to give is something that will last for, forever. Um, we have to give up everything. In Matthew 5, 29, it says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. If it's better for you to lose one part of the body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. You know, we're talking about giving up everything to be saved. Tear out your eye. He's like, if you have trouble with pornography, I want you to rip your eye out and throw it away. I want you to take that smartphone and say, you know, I don't need, I can't have this. This is my eye. And I got to tear it out and I got to get rid of it. I got to get a flip phone. Yeah, they're probably higher, but who cares? The scripture says... It's better to lose one part than to lose the whole soul. And we're asked to give up everything. In Luke 5, 27, he went out and he noticed this tax collector named Levi. We heard this on the way to church. He's sitting in the booth and it says, he says to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Didn't even go tell his parents by. Like, go on. Guys, when Jesus is calling you that hard, and I'm hoping he's calling somebody in this room right now that hard, you're ready to get up. I remember I fought it for 21 years. And when I, like, when I finally said, God, this is enough, I do not remember the walk up front. But it happened fast, swiftly, and the preacher was really confused because I was serving in the church when I got saved. He thought we was getting ready to pray over something physical that I had going. I'm like, yeah, I need my soul saved. I'm tired of being on a path to hell. I'm on a path to heaven. And so when that happens, it is an awesome thing. But he, like this Levi, Matthew, he left everything and followed him. If you look at how when he called each one of them, he's walking down the beach. He's like, get out of the boat, let's go. You know what they did? They got out of the boat and left their dad there and they went. They almost dropped their nets and left. 
Like it's an instant. Yes, we give up everything to follow him, but what is what we get in return is so worth more. It is so worth more. We've we've talked about stuff here that it's not an easy walk all the time. It's not. But that's when you know you're doing it the right way. And the treasures that you're laying up there last forever. We'll, the, we're going to cover this in the next session. i got two pages of notes. You may not get to talk. Um, but there's treasures being laid up in heaven that, are, that will last forever. And that's what we're working for. That's what we're doing. Because we want people to go to heaven with us. And it says, why? So you're sitting here right now. If you're lost in this room and you've heard me talk and you're like, why would I follow this man if i got to give up everything? Why? It's an, it's an honest question. In Mark 10, 10, 29 through 30, Jesus said, so it's in red highlights, as I heard last night, because Jesus said it. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children and farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, and but he will receive a hundred times as much. So whatever you're giving up, there's a promise from God, you're going to receive a hundred times as much. Hundred times as much. Now in this present age, the houses of brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, the eternal life. You're going to receive hundredfold of what you think you're giving up in this world. And what we're typically giving up is the stuff we don't need. It's the stuff the world says we need, not what God says we need, not what we truly need in our lives. It's just temporary here, but what he is offering lasts forever. John 3.30 says, he must increase and I must decrease. So I got to ask you today, we're getting ready to go to an altar time. I think we got it. Yeah. Have you ever gave up everything to follow this man? Have you ever gave up everything to follow a guy that laid it all out? He took his cross. He died. He shed his blood because his blood is the only thing that could save us. His blood is the only thing that could atone for our sin. In the Old Testament, all they could do was cover their sin with the blood of an animal. They could cover it. Jesus took it all with his blood. His blood don't cover the sin. His blood forgives the sin. That's why the ones of old had to stay in paradise and wait because they had only covered their sin. They couldn't go to heaven yet because the Son of God hadn't shed his blood. And he shed it for you. He shed it for me and you so we can have eternal life. Yes, we have to give up everything here, but it's a hundredfold there. It's a hundredfold there. So I ask you today, have you ever asked him in your heart? You know, we, we, this is question and response, and I, I just feel like there's somebody in the room that's never said, I'm yours. And it may be you're saved, but you never said, I'm yours. You do with me what you want. I will die to my cross today, and I will go follow you. I will go serve where you've called me to serve. I'll go use the gifts that you bless me with. You want to know how you get treasures in heaven? You start using the gifts he's blessed us with. Like, do you want to stand before him? Listen, if you're not staying, listen to the next sermon. We're going to be judged. We're going to be at a beam of seat judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to look at not your sin. It's been covered in full. Jesus paid that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about what you did with it afterwards. That's where you're laying up those treasures that last forever. That's where we're laying up that stuff that's a hundredfold to what we're giving up. So what are you doing with what your salvation? What are you doing with it? Do you have it? I pray if you don't have it that today's your day. Pastor D is going to be up here. Like there's so many things that happen in this church that we don't even know about. People get saved all the time because you guys are doing what you're supposed to do. You're laying up treasures in heaven. You're leading people to the one and only Savior, and I love it. But I feel like today, these altars are open, guys. You don't have to wait on me. Come up and pray about what God's working in your life. But most of all, if you're not saved, come and talk to us. Man, he says he's coming on a cloud, and it's coming quick. It's going to be here like that and gone. Don't be left here. Go with us. I promise it's going to be a lot better of a ride. I promise. A hundredfold's waiting. A hundredfold's waiting for each one of us. So if you need to talk, we'll be here. The altar is yours. Let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen.
Folks, we are so glad you're here at Renovation Church. If you haven't been here through the week, please come on Wednesday nights. For my class, we're actually moving to a room which is bigger this week, and it supposedly has air conditioning. So I think Dustin promised that he would come fan us if it didn't work. He's totally not listening at all. So, um, folks, the tithe boxes are back on the wall. Use the church app. I want to share one piece of scripture for you as you guys leave. Something to think about, and it's going to kind of revolve around your walk with God, okay? So let me read this to you, and let's talk just a second, then we'll go. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. So I hope when you're going through this week, you kind of keep this in mind. And so just understand all these great things and all these great talents, and God has given you so much. But let me ask you this question. Are the people around you closer to God because of what you're doing? Okay. Are they looking at you and thinking, Man, I wish I was closer to Christ because that's what being close to Christ looks like. It's having all this love in your life. Okay? Just something to think about. I hope you have a great week. And I hope that as you go out this week, that love of Christ works on you. And through you, it works on people around you. Let's go to him in prayer.